Dennis Olson is the Charles T. Haley Professor of Old Testament Theology at Princeton Theological Seminary, an ordained member of the ELCA, originally from Laverne, Minnesota. Dennis holds degrees from Augustana College, Sioux Falls, Luther Theological Seminary, and Yale University. If we were to play walk-up music for Dennis tonight, like they play for Joe Maurer <laughs> at the baseball stadium, I think that we would play They Call Me the Breeze, because Dennis is such a breath, breath of fresh air blown in by the Holy Spirit. When he joined the Old Testament faculty at Princeton, Dennis broke up a cartel of five Harvard-trained Frank Moore Cross educated faculty at Princeton. As Seinfeld would say, not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> but Dennis brought the fresh air of Brevard's child's inspired canonical criticism and literary approaches to Old Testament theology. Dennis is also a breath of fresh air in the classroom. Maybe he gets it from his educator wife, Carol, whom I wish Dennis had brought with him tonight. But Dennis is a whiz kid of a pedagogue. His classroom moves are creative, flexible, and inspiring. Dennis is also a breath of fresh air in biblical studies, where he specializes in theological readings of the Pentateuch. His major works include a commentary and an important monograph on numbers, a creative monograph on Deuteronomy, a commentary on judges, many significant articles and essays, and he's currently working on a major commentary on Exodus. His colleagues at Princeton Seminary report that he is diligent and thorough to a fault. That fault being, of course, that his diligence and thoroughness can be existentially threatening to the rest of us. <laughs> it's fitting that we welcome Dennis to the second Faith and Terence Fretheim lecture because Dennis is also one of Terry's most important students, and he has continued Terry's legacy of investigating the Bible for discovering who the God of the Bible is that meets us as we open those pages. The only flaw that I can find to mention is that Dennis once referred to Lefsa as a Norwegian potato tortilla. <laughs> This mistake most likely occurred because he had been too long gone from home. So Dennis, welcome home. Cue, they call me the breeze and join me in welcoming uh, Dennis Olson for tonight's lecture. Thank you very much, Rolf. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, back at Luther Seminary once again. I want to begin with a word of appreciation for this invitation from the uh, lecture committee to uh, Terry and Faith Fretheim, uh, in whom this lecture uh, uh, provides honor. And as a Master of Divinity student at Luther some 38 years ago, uh, this semester, I was taking a class with Terry Fretheim entitled The Suffering and Humanity of God. And um, it was uh, a rich class and has, from that time, and along with all of Terry's influential publishing across the uh, decades, has been uh, important and shaped me in many, many ways that have been very important. Uh, Rolf mentioned my wife is a teacher, and uh, she has on her bottom of her email this saying, your students may not remember everything that you taught them, but they will always remember how you made them feel. And for Terry, uh, those who know him, his kindness, his compassion, his respect for students, his excitement uh, for what he was studying and what he sought to incite in us in terms of our passion for the Old Testament and for the study of God in the Old Testament uh, is something that is deeply remembered by myself, but also by hundreds and hundreds of students over many years that he served. Uh, I was privileged to study with uh, many good professors here, and um, 
uh, one of those I want to uh, lift up, and that's Jim Limber, who was my first Old Testament teacher at Augustana College in Sioux Falls, and got me on the track into Old Testament, um, and then came here, to, and I had him as a student, as a, a professor here as well. So uh, I have many good uh, feelings of kinship and remembrance of my time that's here. My topic this evening, my God, why the variety of biblical responses to human suffering? As one of nearly nine million species on planet Earth, we as human beings have been given the capacity, the responsibility, and the gift of being able to contemplate and ponder the deeper meanings and mysteries of our experiences of deep pain, intense suffering, and our inevitable death. What wisdom and what resources have our biblical ancestors left us in scripture as we seek to understand and cope with profound tragedies and losses in our lives? My purpose this evening is to walk with you through the Old Testament to sample some of the varied responses to human suffering. And my hope is that this more expansive biblical repertoire of possible biblical responses to human suffering may enrich and stimulate our pastoral imaginations as we are called to respond to suffering, whether uh, of our own or those with whom uh, we may work. Let me begin with two preliminary observations. One, suffering in the Bible is addressed in many different contexts and situations. And what may be an appropriate response or testimony in one context may not be a helpful or appropriate response in another situation. And second, all answers to this important issue of responding to human pain and tragedy are ultimately only partial answers. Genuine and helpful insight can indeed be gathered from scripture about the possible meanings of suffering, but questions will remain. Some mysteries persist. Now I will examine the range of responses to suffering in scripture using three broad categories designated by three short words or phrases. One, why, two, how, and thirdly, both and. The first category, the why, set of responses are answers to human tragedy that operate primarily at a rational or intellectual level. And the sort of responses offer reasons why suffering occurs in human life, why disaster happens to some and not to others. These why responses are most appropriate when we have some distance from the actual experience or situation, some space in time for reflection. And the second broad category, the how responses to suffering, offer resources that help the sufferer just to hang on for the moment. The question here is less why, more how. How will I survive and endure through this immediate pain or tragedy for another day? How do I respond to suffering in the midst of a crisis when the despair and the pain are simply overwhelming? These how responses provide coping mechanisms and support for the moment. They offer one small step forward. The third broad category, what I would call both and responses, involve intense dialogues among multiple, often conflicting and contradictory responses held together at the same time. The juxtaposition of these conflicting responses bang together against one another, creating a cauldron of unresolved and theological tension that often defies resolution or closure from a human frame of reference. This third set of dialogical responses of unresolved tension, both and responses, occur especially in biblical contexts of extreme and intense suffering and disaster. So first, why? Rational responses to human suffering. Why are we suffering? What reasons might explain a sudden illness, an untimely death, a natural disaster, an act of injustice, an act of violence, or a state of oppression? The Bible offers several possible ways by which we can answer that why question. First is suffering can be the consequence of sin. One way to explain suffering in a rational way is to say that it is a consequence of our own making. 
we disobey God's law or covenant, we violate a moral order of life. God has built into the fabric of reality uh, these orders of moral uh, life and structure. This notion of just retribution is a common explanation in the, in the scriptures. And so the book of Deuteronomy, which is a kind of covenantal document in many ways, introduces a list of harsh curses for disobedience of God's covenant with these words. If you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all the commandments and the statutes that I command you this day, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. The curses in Deuteronomy 28 warn of foreign invasion, siege, famine, and exile. 1 Kings 14 explains, in light of those curses, why the northern kingdom of Israel was defeated and exiled by the Assyrians in 722 BCE. The prophet proclaims, the Lord will smite Israel and root up Israel from this good land which the Lord gave to their ancestors and scatter them beyond the Euphrates River because, the reason why, they have made their asherim, their idols of foreign gods, provoking the Lord to anger. And the Lord will give Israel up because of the sins of King Jeroboam, which he sinned and which he made Israel to sin. And so it is often the leaders who have particular responsibility in these matters. Likewise, the Babylonians' horrific destruction of the holy city of Jerusalem and its temple in 586 BCE and the exile that followed it is traced to the sins of King Manasseh of Judah. Because Manasseh had committed these abominations, the text says in 2 Kings 21, and has caused Judah also to sin with his idols, therefore thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I'm bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such evil that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. Suffering may be the consequence of human sin by a community, by a nation, and by its leaders. This is not just an Old Testament theme. In the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 5, the post-resurrection community of followers of Christ in Jerusalem sold their properties and offered the proceeds to the apostles to support the mission of spreading the gospel. One member of that community named Ananias sold his property and then contrary to instructions, retained some of the revenue for himself. The apostle Peter rebuked Ananias. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? You have not lied, lied to humans, but you have lied to God. And the text says, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. Sin consequence. But this simple sin consequence equation doesn't really reflect the subtlety of the Bible's perspective on sin and human responsibility. Professor Fretheim, for whom this lecture is named, has argued that the biblical understanding of God and judgment is more nuanced and robust than a simple you sin, God punishes you scheme. Fredheim notes three ways in which the scriptures nuance this sin consequence equation. First, Fredheim claims that in the Old Testament, human misdeeds and their corresponding negative consequences occur within a divinely created moral order that is built into the fabric of creation, what he terms a loose causal weave or a sin consequence vortex of cause and effect. That is to say, Fredheim writes, the consequences grow out of the deed itself. They're not a penalty or a reward introduced by God into the situation. God is not a micromanaging interventionist. Fredheim points to biblical texts like Jeremiah 17. I, the Lord, will give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. Consequences, the fruit of their own sin. God warns in Ezekiel 22, I have returned their conduct upon their heads. What they did comes back upon them. Galatians 6, you reap whatever you sow. Secondly, however, this created moral order of sin and consequence 
doesn't mean for Fredheim that God is entirely removed from the process. God may influence the dynamics to a greater or lesser extent as God pleases. Thus, God may aggressively intervene to harden the heart of Pharaoh, or God may withdraw protection from Israel's enemies and let the consequences play out. Fredheim writes, God is active in the interplay of human sinful actions and their effects, and third parties may also be used by God as agents for that judgment. Thus, in Isaiah chapter 10, God interprets the Assyrian army and its attack on the sinful northern kingdom of Israel. Ah, Assyria, God says, the rod of my anger, the club in my hands is my fury. Thirdly, Fretheim nuances this intellectual response to human suffering of sin and consequence with the concession that the causal weave that binds sin to its consequences in the Bible is loose and not tight. Fredheim observes this moral order does not function in any mechanistic, precise, or inevitable way. It's not a tight causal weave. And so it may be that the wicked will prosper, Jeremiah chapter 12, at least for a time, and the innocent will suffer for unknown reasons, the book of Job, or get caught up in the effects of the sins of others, Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes introduces an element of chance or randomness in relating human deeds to their effects. Time and chance happen to them all. The looseness of the causal weave, Fredheim writes, allows God to be at work in the system without violating or temporarily suspending it. I think Fredheim rightly avoids here an overly mechanistic notion of sin and consequence, but one may ponder this question. When does a structured moral order, a system of sin and consequence, become too loose a causal weave, too unstructured a system, to provide a satisfactory intellectual response to the why of human suffering? How far does the weave stretch before it breaks? So, suffering as a consequence of sin, an intellectual response to the why question. A second response to the why of suffering is that God will bring something good out of suffering. Going through a painful experience may teach one a positive lesson. Proverbs chapter 3, my child, don't despise the Lord's discipline, for the Lord reproves the one he loves. One of Job's friends, Eliphaz, tries to encourage a beaten down Job How happy is the one whom God reproves. Therefore, do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he binds up. He strikes, but his hands heal. This point is made most succinctly in the story of Joseph and his brothers in Genesis chapter 37 through 50. Joseph is a 17-year-old young brat in some ways, (laughs) favored by his brother, Uh, He is given a coat, uh, favored by his father, uh, and the father gives Joseph a coat, and Joseph parades in front of his brothers with that coat. They decide to sell him into slavery, and then, after a time of unjust imprisonment in Egypt, Joseph rises to become second in command next to Pharaoh in charge of emergency food distribution. Looking for food, the brothers of Joseph travel to Egypt. The brothers are dismayed to discover that their long lost brother Joseph is still alive, and more than that, he is a man of power and position. Joseph now could take whatever revenge he might wish to inflict on his brothers who had sold him into slavery years before. After putting his brothers through a series of tests to see if they have changed, Joseph is able to look back over his experience of suffering and answer the question, why did I go through all of that? Joseph says to his brothers, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Joseph concluded 
that his life of personal pain and suffering in the end was used by God to keep many starving people alive, including his own family. God can make good come out of suffering for others and for oneself. Now, it should be emphasized that this intellectual answer to the question why of suffering is one that should be self-discovered rather than imposed by someone else from the outside. The response works best when we have had some distance from our own sufferings, had time to reflect upon what we have endured, so we have a longer view on some past pain or crisis and how it may have affected our life for the better. This is an answer rarely of much comfort to anyone in the midst of the depths of suffering itself. A third rational response is that suffering can come from evil forces. This answer to the why of suffering doesn't develop very fully until the end of the Old Testament period. Ancient Israel gradually developed towards a monotheistic faith, the belief in one singular God in contrast to the ancient neighboring cultures who believed in multiple gods. Polytheistic religions outside of Israel were able to explain seemingly unjust or excessive suffering of their people as the result of jealous infighting among multiple competing gods acting capriciously in the heavenly divine council. But that kind of explanation was not available to ancient Israel. In contrast, Israel's faith in one God alone meant that suffering tended to be understood as arising out of a complex union of God's anger and God's love. Yet at the end of the Old Testament period in the second century BCE, apocalyptic visions of the book of Daniel appear in the book. The bizarre apocalyptic visions in Daniel 7 through 12 portray intense battles between God's warrior angels battling against powers of cosmic evil attached to local Greek rulers in Jerusalem who persecuted Jews and desecrated their sacred temple. The portrayal of these evil forces or powers as a cause of human suffering became a more common explanation in the New Testament with images of Satan as a prime opponent to God and the, and the mission of Jesus, as well as uh, language of cosmic or spiritual powers and principalities and demons that afflict people and cause evil in our world. Now, we, we may wrestle with how we best translate such ancient notions of demons or Satan in our modern world. On the other hand, it may be, uh, in, in certain contexts, helpful to recognize the presence of external forces or powers at work in our lives and our communities that cause individuals or groups to suffer in some way. Such malevolent power may manifest itself as a hateful and violent mob out of control, a xenophobic hatred of the other that spreads like a virus through a community, a demonic drug that takes over a person's will, a virulent disease or cancer that attacks the body, a lingering hatred or depression that just will not let us go, a communal denial of an impending disaster, or an addiction to abusive power, self-serving materialism, or self-righteous moralism that overtakes a social group or an entire society. Suffering may come from a source other than God or ourselves, and it may be helpful to frame our struggle as joining with God in a battle against a common enemy. A fourth rational response to the why question is that suffering is a mystery. The Bible proclaims that we humans are epistemologically challenged. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord, Isaiah 55. We are only created beings, we are not God. The tragic figure of Job in the Old Testament suffers the loss of everything, his material wealth, his servants, the life of his children, and his own health and well-being. 
Job suffers even worse the terrible advice and counsel of his so-called friends who seek to defend God by telling Job he must have done something wrong to bring all this suffering on himself. They insist that suffering is not God's fault, it's Job's sin that has brought his agony upon him. The friends are here, of course, a model of how not to be a pastoral counselor. (laughs) They begin simply by sitting with him for a few days. Would that they would have continued that practice. Job knows he is righteous, and he demands to know why he is suffering. And over the course of 35 chapters, Job engages in intense poetic dialogue with his friends over the possible meanings of his sufferings. God finally appears to Job after, at the, toward the end of the book, after Job has repeatedly demanded to have the opportunity to challenge God face to face about the injustice of his suffering. And so God tells Job that he will have difficulty knowing the answers to his deepest questions about the why of his suffering when Job doesn't understand the basics of God's formation of the world, the vastness and the diversity of all of God's many wild creatures, including the great sea monster Leviathan. Job chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Who is this? that darkens counsel by words without knowledge. Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Job God God asks in chapter 41, Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook? or press down its tongue with a cord? The implied answer, can you handle and tame this wild chaos monster? No, but God can tame and use chaos for God's purposes. Turning to the New Testament, when the Apostle Paul suffers from what he calls a thorn in the flesh, he repeatedly begs God to remove the pain so that he might serve more effectively as God's Apostle. Three times I asked the Lord about this throne, this thorn, writes Paul, that it should leave me. But the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In the final chapter of the book of Job, God declares to Job's friends that Job was right. He was right to keep pressing his challenging and unanswered questions to God. The Lord turns to Job's friends who thought they had been piously defending God, and God condemns them for trying to squelch and repress Job's questions. My wrath, God declares to the friends, is kindled against you, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. God goes on to inform Job's friends that Job will have to step in and pray a prayer of intercession before God on behalf of his friends. My servant Job will pray for you, says God, not to deal with you according to your folly. And even though Job in the end doesn't get all the answers to his questions and his suffering remain for him a painful mystery, Job was right to probe, to push the envelope, to challenge, to search for questions as to the meaning of his suffering. In doing so, however, he and we may also have to accept that there are limits to what we know. Paul reached a similar similar epistemological limit when wrestling to understand God's unbreakable covenant with Israel in light of the coming of Christ in Romans 11. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments how inscrutable his ways. Those then are rational uh, intellectual responses to human suffering, answering the why question. And now another second broad category of responses, how responses, survival or endurance responses to human suffering. Here we ask what resources scripture offers to those overwhelmed by trauma, grief, or tragedy in the immediacy of the moment. The pressing concern is not to explain the why, the urgent need is how. How are we going to endure this tragedy? What is needed are resources, 
a word, an action, a process, a presence, something to help us endure in the present moment. These resources may enable the one in the midst of an unbearable pain to hang on and to take a tentative step forward. These are response, responses less concerned with why, more concerned with how. The first, lamenting before God. Lamenting should be a natural part of our human existence. And yet our culture many times suppresses laments. Keep a stiff upper lip, don't cry, don't be a baby, suck it in, no pain, no gain. Or in the words of a song years ago, don't worry, be happy. Churches sometimes do the same in terms of suppressing laments. It's not unusual for the psalms of lament to be ignored, carefully edited, or considered to be unworthy for people of faith. How often have you heard in worship the whole text of Psalm 137, a community of lament of psalms, of psalm of Jewish exiles in Babylon who have been forced from their homes, made to live in a foreign land, the psalm laments the Babylonians' destruction of Jerusalem and its temple. It laments the way the Edomites, the neighboring nation, joined in with the Babylonians in the destruction of the city. The shameful forced migration over hundreds of miles to Babylon. And as their Babylonian captors mock the desperate Jewish exiles, the community sings in pain. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem. O daughter of Babylon, you devastator, happy shall be the one who pays you back with what you've done to us. Happy shall be the one who takes your little children and dashes them against the rock. That's the conclusion of the psalm. No sudden turn to praise or thanks to God, in, as in many other laments. No expression of trust that things will get better. Just raw anger, despair, and a desire for revenge. The suffering of the community was agonizingly real and intense. They had lost everything. Their land, their home, their temple, their loved ones, their dignity, their hope, their identity. And in the throes of immediate and overwhelming agony, sitting within a supportive community and giving voice to words of rage, feelings of pain, and yearnings for justice, those are faithful practices as natural as the cry of a newborn as it exits the birth canal and is thrown into the world. Some years ago, I heard a psychologist named Dr. John Kildall give a lecture relating psychology and Christian faith. And Dr. Kildall had established a mental health center in Brooklyn, New York, and he told this story about that center. The procedure at the clinic was very well clearly mapped out. People would walk in through the front door of the clinic, and immediately there at the front door was a, uh, a desk with a counselor named Alan Cross who sat at the desk and invited the person who came in from the street to sit down. And it was very clear that Alan's job was simply to have the person tell their story of why they had come into the clinic, what had brought them there. And he would then write it down and record it, and then he would pass the uh, client down the hallway to Dr. Kildall's office, who was a clinical psychologist. And Dr. Kildall reported that a surprising percentage of the clients that came into his office would say something like this. Dr. Kildall, I'm sure you're just a wonderful psychologist, but would it be all right if I worked with that counselor, Mr. Cross? He's wonderful. He's helped me so much already. Something had happened just by the fact that that person was able to tell their story to lament, to tell why they had come, what their problem was, and another human being listened attentively to them. A step forward had begun in their process. Lament is a step forward. Uh, it may not be 
a resolution at all, but it begins a process of healing. The Psalms of Lament, however, may be essential even when there is no hope of healing or resolution in a person's life. When I was a pastor in a congregation, a farmer named John was struggling during a time of severe upheaval in the agricultural economy. Land prices had plummeted. Many farmers were losing their family farms. John had extended a loan to a close relative in order to help him save his farm and his family. And the consequence of this act of love was that John and his own family eventually lost their own farm for which he had worked his whole life. And in the midst of all of this, John found out that he was dying of an inoperable bone cancer. His body began painfully withering away as he got thinner and weaker over the course of several months. And whenever I would visit John, he would always ask me the same question. Pastor, would you read me some of those psalms again? And he meant the psalms of lament, psalms like Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? To lament provided a process, a way of coping, a way of surviving for another day through the unexplainable pain that John knew would end only with his death. We need to lament, to cry in the context of a community, to express the pain that we feel deep inside. A, sef- a second survival or endurance response, how do we get through this, is to s- uh, encourage this, to wait in the expectation that help is on the way. Some biblical psalms offer a second response as a way to endure, an invitation to be patient and trust that God will act to help. Be still before the Lord, Psalm 37, and wait patiently for him. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord, Psalm 27. The prophet Habakkuk looks out over his society and he sees nothing there but destruction, violence, conflict, and injustice. And the despairing prophet complains to God, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? God's response, God urges patience. Help is on the way. If it seems slow in coming, God says, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. For some voices, like Job, though, who's weary with his fierce struggle with God, his resources became too depleted. Patience and hope are not options at the moment in the course of some of Job's dialogues with his friends. What is my strength, says Job, that I should wait? And what is my end, that I should be patient? But for other biblical voices, they find a way, a way to wait and to trust. And thus the voice of Psalm 40 testifies in past tense about an experience of coming out on the other side. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many times in the Bible, those who suffer begin to hope that in the end, that the end of their misery may be near. And thus the majority, not all, but the majority of laments end on a note of trust and confidence as in Psalm 13. After complaining how long, O Lord, the psalmist ends the prayer, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because the Lord has dealt bountifully with me. Even the tragic figure of Job receives back his wealth and his health so that that he had lost. The Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before, Job 42. God also blessed Job with a whole new set of seven sons and three daughters, the same number of children that had been killed at the beginning of the book. 
We can well imagine as a parent, however, that the memory of the children lost remained forever, a deep wound in Job's soul. The prophets promise that Israel's long exile in Babylon will end and God will bring the Jewish exiles back home to Jerusalem on a highway through the desert. And so Isaiah 40 promises, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. For some biblical traditions, hope and waiting for God's deliverance may extend to a far distant future with the promise of a new covenant, Jeremiah 31, a new heart for God's people, Ezekiel 11, a new heaven and a new earth in Isaiah 65 or Revelation 21. But how much hope can we offer? And when is it time to interrupt the lament and begin to promise deliverance? For many sufferers, the present may seem to be only a bottomless pit or a dead-end street with no possible way of escape. And so if we rush in too quickly to try and offer an overly optimistic and premature word of hope, the offer may well seem shallow, meaningless, or even hurtful. I recall once as a pastor sitting with a family uh, around a hospital bed, the father uh, was dying from a diseased heart. All of his adult children were with him there. His wife was there. It was a quiet, holy time. Uh, each child took turns holding their father's hand as he approached uh, over the course of a day or two his coming death. And as we were there, quiet, lights were dimmed, all of a sudden the door of the hospital room bursts open and in comes a husband and wife who were neighbors uh, to the dying man. And they were kind of bubbly kind of people and they came in and said, Hi Art, how are you doing? Oh, you look great. And our son, I'm not doing very well. The doctors say I'm dying. He was very forthright about where he was at. And one of his children, was a da his daughter, was a psychiatric nurse who worked in Seattle with Vietnam veterans. And she was having none of this. <laughs> she jumped up, put her body between her father and this couple, and turned them around and said, thanks for coming, but don't come back and push them out the door. Now, they had intended to be positive, uh, but it was the wrong response in the midst of that context. If we rush in too quickly to try and smooth things over, we can be heard as inappropriate and not helpful. And yet God's ultimate desire for God's people is what is good. The prophet Jeremiah reassured despairing exiles with God's promise. For surely I know the plans I have for you, Jeremiah said, to give you a future with hope. And how that future and hope may work out in the experience of a suffering individual or community is not always clear and not always for us to know. Our first obligation may be simply to be present with those in pain, to listen and to pray to discern the way forward. A third coping response, how do we get through this next day, is a response that goes like this, here I am, Lord, use what little I have. A third strategy for how to endure is at least to do something, no matter how small it might seem. If God is with us, we trust that God might bless our meager efforts to offer assistance. A young boy offered Jesus what little he had, a few loaves of bread, a couple of fish, and Jesus blessed it and multiplied it sufficiently to feed thousands. The Bible has other stories of small efforts with big results. When the Egyptian pharaoh commanded that all male Hebrew babies be killed at birth, the Hebrew midwives said no when pharaoh commanded them to kill Hebrew babies as they were born. The midwives lied about the Hebrew mothers. We can't get to the birth in time to kill the babies, the midwives told Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous, they're strong, and they give birth before the midwife comes to them. A small but significant act, the Bible's first example of civil disobedience against an empire's oppressive injustice, 
that would eventually lead to freedom for the Hebrew slaves. When God called Moses to lead the Israelites out of slavery, Moses replied, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God replies, don't worry, I will be with you. The book of Judges, a man named Gideon complained to God with this lament, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all of God's wonderful deeds that our ancestors recounted to us saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has cast us off and given us into the hand of our enemies, the Midianites. And God's response? The Lord returned, the Lord turned to Gideon and said, Go in this might of yours, and you deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. I hereby consecrate you. Gideon responds, but sir, how can I deliver Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I am the least in my family. And then the Lord said to Gideon, but I will be with you. That is what is important. You see a problem? You see somebody suffering, like Moses and Gideon, like the Hebrew midwives and the young boy with loaves and fishes in the midst of disaster and suffering, we may simply be called to act, to offer something to God's work, as inadequate as it may seem in our human eyes. We trust that God might bless our efforts and provide what we lack. So, a series of why responses, a series of how responses. Finally, category both and, what I would call dialogical or dialectical responses to human suffering. The two biblical books that contain the most sustained reflections on the topic of human suffering as whole books in the Old Testament are the book of Job and the book of Lamentations. And I want to suggest that these two books deal with unfathomable suffering and pain by blending together a dissonant chorus of conflicting genres, themes, voices, and responses to human suffering, all of which are held together in a uniquely dialogical or dialectical tension that resists closure and resolution. The book of Job combines two very different genres. Chapters 1 and 2 begin as a folktale about God's servant Job, whom God considered more righteous than any other human on earth. God had blessed Job richly, and one of God's advisors in the heavenly divine council named the Satan, the adversary, dares God to take away all of Job's blessings, and let's see how Job's faith is then. Let's heap disaster after disaster on Job's head in order to see whether Job will remain so righteous. The Satan asks, does, God fear, does Job fear God for nothing? The advisor wagers that when Job begins to suffer, he will quickly lose his righteousness and he will curse God. Immediately after these two chapters of a prose narrative, the book continues with 35 chapters of poetry poetry that wrestles with the meaning of Job's sufferings as he argues with his so-called friends about the reasons for his suffering and Job's desire to confront and challenge God. The diverse themes and perspectives of the different friends and Job's responses include some versions of the responses that we've covered, in both the intellectual responses, the why, as well as the endurance responses, the how, that are there. They're they're scattered about in the book of Job and in the dialogue between Job and his friends. God then appears to Job out of the powerful whirlwind after Job and his friends finish their dialogues. And God engages in a poetic dialogue with Job. What is remarkable in these poetic dialogues is how different perspectives that may hold some tentative truth value within the larger canon of scripture but which seem also often to contradict one another, are held in abeyance throughout the book. Oftentimes, the dialogues are like two trains passing in the night. Old Testament scholar Carol Newsom, in her study, The Book of Job, A Contest of Moral Imaginations, she calls the Book of Job a polyphonic or multi-voiced text, using the categories of the Russian literary theorist Mikhail Bakhtin. 
in which the different genres and the different verbal textures and the competing theological claims concerning Job and his suffering create a complex interplay of voices that are finally unresolved by the end of the book. Job ends without Job ever receiving from God a clear answer to his question of why he, as a righteous person, had to suffer the loss of so much. The other book, the Book of Lamentations, the five poems that make up Lamentations likewise combine a dizzying array of conflicting genres, a funeral dirge, a lament spoken in the personified voice of the city of Jerusalem, the lament of an individual sufferer, and then a series of community laments, all brought together as a hodgepodge of emotionally charged reactions to the horrors of the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem in 586. The first four poems are acrostics, with the first letter of each line following the sequence of the 22 letters or consonants in the Hebrew Bible. The fifth and the last poem of the book, however, does not follow the same acrostic pattern following the sequence of the Hebrew alphabet, suggesting a kind of disintegration of the pattern at the end of the book, which signals the unresolved and chaotic mix of explanations and responses to the Babylonian disaster. The Book of Lamentations includes a remarkable set of jarring shifts and juxtapositions among conflicting and seemingly incompatible responses to the same disaster. One response, Lamentations contains confessions of Israel's sin and affirmations of God's justified judgment on the city of Jerusalem because of its transgressions. A second response, a communal lament and charge of injustice against God that many of those who suffer, especially children, are innocent. A third response, Lamentations chapter 3, is an individual lament that swings wildly between protests against God as a ruthless enemy placed alongside beautiful and eloquent statements of God's mercy and faithfulness and compassion. A fourth response in Lamentations, another individual psalm, lavishly praises God and requests that God take vengeance on the enemies of Jerusalem. And then a fifth response, Lamentations chapter 5, contains a charge against God that the city of Jerusalem is unjustly suffering for the sins of past generations rather than the present generation. A sixth theme, another poetic section, expresses trust and confidence in the goodness of God. And finally, a seventh theme, complaints charged that although the people may have sinned, the punishment Jerusalem has experienced is unjustifiably harsh. Now, what might we say about the significance of these two books, Job and Lamentations, that contain such a density of conflictive and dissonant themes and voices that swirl around the chaos of such profound human tragedy and pain. The two books defy straightforward interpretation. I would argue, however, that part of the function of these biblical books is to point us to the deeper truths and the more profound mystery that are churned up in the midst of the unresolved dialogue around the goodness of God and the intense pain of much human suffering. Another function is to give, it gives is to affirm the appropriateness of competing and often contradictory voices that often ricochet through our own minds when we are facing unimaginable evil, loss, or disaster. There is a kind of psychological reality uh, to the chaos within these books of people going through such disaster. Resolution and closure at such times are hard to come by. We've noted this evening a wide diversity of biblical responses to human suffering, some more rational, attempt to explain the why of suffering. Other resources aim more at the how of suffering, seeking to help the sufferer endure the moment, hang on, and perhaps move a small step forward 
in the face of what are sometimes deeply tragic events. A third set of biblical texts hold together a complex dialogue of competing and unresolved voices and responses to horrific tragedies and sufferings, reflecting the chaos of the spirit that intense suffering may engender. For many people who struggle and suffer, a time may come when they believe that God has heard their cry and hope there is a possibility down the road of something that will be better. They continue to believe in God in spite of the realities that challenge that belief. The psalmist moves from lament to praise. Job begins to rebuild trust in God and is so, no longer so weighed down by his unanswered questions. For others, of course, suffering may erode their trust and sense of security in the promises of God. There is nothing that we can do as humans that can guarantee that faith and trust in God will continue for one who has endured great and painful suffering. That's God's work. We can try to remove as many barriers and open as many doors as possible between God and the sufferer. We can share our own experience and our faith. We can make available those biblical resources through which God has promised to give some insight and strength, the why, the how, the both and. It is the spirit who will have to do the rest. In the meantime, we are called to be a community to one another, especially in times of suffering. We are called to lift up the answers of our biblical tradition and story to the problem of tragedy and pain, and yet also confess that those answers are only partial and paradoxical. We believe, and yet we do not. We lament, and yet we hope. We die, and yet we live. In times of trial and suffering, we may wish for more, for more answers, for more clarity, for more understanding. Our biblical ancestors wished for more, and so do we. But what God has given us, God's word, God's presence, God's only Son, the Spirit and Comforter. That is enough. And so we remember God's words to the Apostle Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Thank you. pushing 8 o'clock and we have a reception waiting for us, but uh, I know we are, um, have time for a few questions. Catherine, you, are you here with the microphone? Or oh, there's a microphone in the center row and a microphone in the side row if, you, if anyone uh, has a question for Professor Olson. I see a rather shy person coming to the microphone. <laughs> Ah, it was delightful, Denny, thank you. It was rich, subtle. I understand why so many of your colleagues, you know, sweat uh, at the sort of learning you bring to bear. I just want to uh, tweak on a concept that you really captured my imagination with. Um, when you started, it, you started with a nice humorous line. Uh, in your own low-key low way, you know that we human beings seem to be epistemologically uh, challenged. Um, that tends to be the dominant tradition in the Western church for dealing with the whole question you took up, namely, this problem is limits, and, and uh, Augustine likes that metaphor, and Thomas Aquinas, and then it kind of makes its great peak in Kant. Um, and you played out your scriptural passages nicely under that theme of limits, but some of them didn't fit as well as I think your own tradition would lead you to want, you know, to look at them differently. But I'm, I'm not sure. We're going to check. The one, the, there are two other major traditions on the same question. There's 
Gregory of Nazianzus articulates that there's a positive mystery. In other words, not on the limits of what it is to be human, but the very nature of God is to overwhelm us with so much uh, mystery. This is not a problem of human limits, but the overwhelmingness of God. That's a very different thing, and I think there's plenty of scripture you could have cited in that heritage. And you did cite some of them, and I said, well, why does that fit in the limit metaphor? And, And then there's our own heritage, we Lutherans that says sometimes God hides. Yeah. And once again, you cited several passages that would have fit that, but you put it within the category of limited, or, or, or you know, that this is a problem of human knowledge yeah. rather than God's choice. And let me go one, one, one step <laughs> further, and, and, and this is to take up Terry's work on this. Terry taking this in this Lutheran insight talks about God's suffering. Yeah, yeah. And you didn't play that theme much because of course you were talking about human suffering, but uh, this hiding God uh, does suffer, yes? And so why, I mean, was it just uh, a decision what you wanted to talk about tonight or is there something else going on in choosing the limit metaphor and, yeah. and avoiding this very Lutheran theme of hiding and suffering God? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank, uh, a wonderful question. And, and that, um, yeah, the hidden God. Um, hiding. hiding God, yes. A God who actively hides. Right. Yes, yes. And... I would say, to understand that, um, so I wouldn't see limits, the limits of human uh, understanding on some of these questions, I wouldn't see as, as necessarily negative or a problem. Um, and I think both the wonder of the great mystery of God in, in, in the Eastern tradition and uh, God hiding, both of those presuppose a kind of limit, right? I mean, if God can hide somewhere, humans are not able to go and, and find that hiding God, and that's a limit. Um, and uh, so I would, uh, I would, so I, when I talk about these, the, limits that are there, it's not, I, and I think the book of Job itself is um, in the spe- God's speech. I mean, it's the wonder of this universe, of this world that God has created, and, and, and God's response to Job is not you're, not, you're not supposed to push on those limits. You, here, here's some of those wonders of this creation. Um, and you may not be able to capture that, but, but Job was right to keep probing that mystery and probing those questions. So the limits for me are not negative, but they are descriptive of the human condition. Um, and, uh, and so I, 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 if I sound too negative about that, um, I'll have to look back and, and redo that. But thank you for the question. Another question. Hi, um, my name is Emily. I'm a second year and a student here. And I'm currently working on a paper on Job suffering in theodicy. So I'm wondering if you can help me write my final. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ellen Davis suggests that God chooses not to control chaos, the consequence, the consequence of which is often human suffering. Um, out of God's commitment to freedom for all creation. If that's true, do we condemn God to being evil or to at least containing evil within God's self? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) That question, uh, I think, there are some questions about God uh, about which uh, we may um, not fully understand. I, so the notion of chaos in, in the book of Job, um, 
And I think the figure of Leviathan, chaos monster, the, and the wonder of that, and chaos, um, when you say God doesn't control chaos, in, in the sense of God not reigning chaos in, but letting it go, letting it have its way. And I, I would affirm that. Yeah, that's, there's a positive role. Job, I think the, the, Job affirms the positive role of chaos in creation. Uh, that God is that allows that to to, uh, to go about, uh, and but to place a moral judgment on that as a negative um, doesn't necessarily follow to me. I, in the Book of Job, doesn't follow. I mean, that, that's um, both God's prerogative, but it's also for the sake of creation that God does that, uh, and the larger purposes of God. <coughs> some of which we may not know fully why that's the case. Um, but, uh, and I, you know, again, I, I talked about these Job and Lamentations holding these uh, tensions together. And so God allowing the chaos and the freedom, uh, and, uh, but also allowing Job to, to, and encouraging Job to, to push and castigating the friends for trying to squelch those kinds of questions uh, along the way. So, um, I, I didn't write your, answer, your paper for you, <laughs> but uh, uh, at least those would be some thoughts to think about. Dennis. Uh, yes. One more, oh, I'm gonna use my privilege, the microphone, to ask the last question. Sure. Before. So, I was surprised that um, in your description of biblical responses to suffering, that um, you didn't talk more about um, what the Bible says about God, what God's going to do. At the first page was, well, you know, God, there's the sin and judgment. And then the part of that was, well, God joins us in fighting evil. But for instance, when you talked about the Lent Psalms, mostly it was about getting our story out. And so much of the Lament Psalms is actually yeah. their cries, their insistence that God be God mm -hmm. in, de in, in the midst of circumstances which it looks like God is choosing not to be God. Yeah. So um, what would you say more precisely or aggressively about God's response to human suffering and what God can and does do? Yeah. Well, I, and it, 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 thanks very much, Rolf, because that's an important question and I didn't raise it up enough, and that is that this, the laments are trying to leverage God to act. Um, and they remember the past and God's faithfulness in the past and make a case if God's going to be consistent with that past, God needs to respond. Um, and uh, I, the Psalms of Lament, as I noted, do the lament, but then all sometimes often go to, to trust and praise, which suggests um, an expectation that's, that God will act. Uh, and in some ways that puts more pressure on God. Um, there's already, you're praising God for something that you expect God will do. So uh, I want to take seriously the, the power of prayer to be taken into account by God and to move God to action uh, and to be faithful to who God uh, has been in the past and who, uh, what the tradition says God is about and what God's plans are. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I would, that's, that's a, I, I take that point well. It's, it's an active engagement. It's not just for the sake of getting our story out. It's not just psychologically healthy, but it is an active prayer to move God towards deliverance and uh, a state of response to the, to the tragedy that's at hand. Yeah. Good. Please join me in thanking uh, Dennis again. Okay, thank you.